All right, good morning, everyone. And I wanna officially welcome you to the 2023 Literacy Awards Successful Practices Conference. This is our first in-person conference since the pandemic, and we are thrilled to be able to celebrate the work of the 2023 Library of Congress Literacy Awards winners and successful practices honorees with you together in this room. I'm Judy Lee, and I manage the Literacy Awards program. As you have probably already seen, we have a very packed agenda today. This morning, we will be recognizing the 18 recipients of the 2023 Literacy Awards, and then we'll get an opportunity to hear from our top three prize winners. After lunch, we'll have an opportunity to dive into deeper conversations about your own insights, successful stories, and lessons learned on the field as the successful practices honorees showcase their literacy programs in an interactive exhibit just down the hall from here. At the end of the day, we may even ask you to share what you learned today. We hope and we trust that you will walk away feeling a sense of community, feeling recognized, and feeling inspired. Putting on an event such as this requires a lot of coordination, talent, and communication. I wanna take a few minutes to thank a few people before we proceed. I wanna begin by thanking Leanne Potter, the Director of the Professional Learning and Outreach Initiatives Office, and Vivian Owume, a Professional Learning Networks Manager, for their leadership <laughs> and wisdom on hosting successful conferences. I also wanna thank my colleagues in the Professional Learning and Outreach Initiatives Office for generously giving their time and advice so that today is as valuable and as efficient as it can be. The Library of Congress Events Office, Daniel Capecci and the multimedia team for taking care of all the logistical, administrative and technical tasks that go into making sure we have everything we need today. Of course, the Literacy Awards Advisory Board members for their leadership and dedication to the Literacy Awards program. Um, to the 2023 winners and honorees who have prepared tirelessly and traveled long distances to participate in today's conference. And of course, to all of you for making literacy a priority and joining us today. Before I invite Karen Risto up here, I just wanna make a few small announcements. As you heard, the room right behind us is um, occupied by another meeting. So we are asking you to leave your personal items either in this room or in Mumford down the hall, which is where we're going to be spending the rest of our afternoon. Additionally, I know that some of you are interested in visiting the Jefferson Building, which makes us really happy and we hope that you do. Um, I do recommend that you go there when the program ends at four, and I do recommend that you try to reserve a timed entry pass, which you can do on the Library of Congress website um, to guarantee that you can get into the Jefferson Building. If you ask any of us with the light green uh, staff sticker, we could show you how to get your timed entry pass. So with that, I'll invite Karen. Thank you, Judith. I have to say it is absolutely wonderful to see you in person because I have already met you through reading your applications, uh, by reading all the applications. The other people who have met you before through reading the applications are members of our advisory committee. Our advisory board has served right along with the staff to develop this program, to kind of set the standards and the criteria and help promote the Literacy Awards. But our major work is to read evaluate, and finally, to recommend the award winners. So I would like you to meet these people. And board members, just stand up when I read your name. So first, Alistair Chang, Chantelle Francois, John Jacobs, a new member, Aaron Laframboise, Salika Lawrence in the back, Donalyn Miller, Naval Quaroni, there you are, Lorraine Roy, Joe Sanchez, a new member, Michael Suarez, and, the, and we have a couple other who will be with us tomorrow for the work. So thank you and congratulations to one and all, and a special thanks to the board for all that you do. The 
Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program is thrilled to recognize 18 organizations for their demonstrated commitment to advancing literacy across the country and around the world. The 2023 winners and honorees are innovative, impactful, and passionate. Through their literacy programs, people of all ages are discovering a love of reading, accessing books, developing reading, writing, and critical thinking skills, and unlocking new opportunities. The David M. Rubenstein Prize recognizes an outstanding and measurable contribution to increasing literacy in the United States or abroad. The Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program is proud to recognize the News Literacy Project for its proven dedication to advancing the practice of news literacy throughout American society. Founded in 2008, the News Literacy Project provides resources and programs to help individuals navigate and analyze media messages and develop media literacy skills such as fact-checking, source evaluation, and media bias awareness. The American Prize goes to an organization in the United States that is making a significant contribution to increasing literacy in the U.S. The Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program is excited to award Downtown Boxing Gym for putting literacy at the core of its programming and significantly improving academic outcomes for high-need young people in Detroit, Michigan. Downtown Boxing Gym believes in the potential of all children and helps 8 to 25-year-olds develop social, emotional, and academic skills through its free out-of-school program. The International Prize category is dedicated to recognizing an organization for its significant contribution to increasing literacy in a country other than the United States. The Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program is excited to award World Reader for providing resources and support to advance literacy for more than 22 million readers in numerous countries. World Reader provides local and culturally relevant digital materials that address socio-emotional learning, gender sensitivity, and cultural and political awareness. The Library of Congress is also pleased to recognize the following 15 organizations for their successful practices in empowering girls and women leaders, Reimagining Literacy Programs. Creating Digital Spaces for Literacy. Connecting with Authors and Illustrators. Elevating Culture and Communities Through Literacy. The Library of Congress thanks the Literacy Awards Advisory Board for their dedication to this program and for recommending this year's winners. And finally, we thank philanthropist David M. Rubenstein for generously supporting the Literacy Awards program since 2013. Please join us in congratulating the 2023 Literacy Awards winners and honorees. Isn't that fun? Thank you to our colleagues in our library's multimedia division and to all of you for sending the photographs and the video footage in so that that film could be made. Um, if you're wondering, yes, it's available on the library's website <laughs> as of today, I think, right? Um, I'm Leanne Potter, and I direct the Office of Professional Learning and Outreach Initiatives here at the library. It is part of the Library of Congress's Center for Learning, Literacy, and Engagement. Um, I've got a few thank yous to extend, and then I've got an introduction to make. So as far as thank yous go, of course I need to thank Karen and our board, and I need to thank Judy. There's an awful lot of effort that goes into an event like this, and frankly into a program like this. and. Lots of hands make lighter work, but it's still work, so thanks to everybody. Um, I also want to extend two very special thank yous. One to Sherry Werb, who is the director of the Center for Learning Literacy and Engagement. 
her support of our work and the work that all of you do is significant. I'd also like to thank Kathy Milliken. I'm not sure if she's with us yet today or not, but she is the director of the Library of Congress's Development Office. Um, as you all know, this program is funded through gift support, and that gift support comes to us because we have a very committed development office, and we couldn't do the work that we do without their support. So a big thank you to Kathy and to the development office as well. I certainly share Judy and Karen's enthusiasm and joy for all of us being in person again. It is so fun to eavesdrop on conversations that are happening and just to hear voices and giggling again. Um, really, I hope that is what we feel all day. I'm really excited. Um, a minute ago, I was talking about strong support, strong support for programs, strong support for each other's work. And this is a perfect lead in to talking about the strong support that this program receives from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Dr. Hayden is unable to be with us in person today, but we do have her virtually. And she is gonna help us extend all of our awardees. Um, at, at when Dr. Hayden announces the award winners, um, our board members are gonna, the chairpersons of our various board committees are gonna be coming up to extend the awards um, to the individuals. And Judy is gonna help sort of make sure that happens as well, because I know you're keeping an eye on things. Um, but as I was saying, Dr. Hayden is a true champion of this program. She is a true champion of literacy, and we are delighted to have her with us at a distance today. It is my honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Carla Hayden. Look, there she is, it's like magic. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Hayden. Very good, good morning, Dr. Hayden. Good morning. Hey, I just described you as a champion of literacy. How do you feel about that? Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, because you are. Thank you for being there's here. Room, well, there's a room full of enthusiastic and committed champions with you and I'm so glad that I'm able through the wonders of technology uh, join you today and to offer my congratulations right off the bat to the 2023 Library of Congress Literacy Award winners and best practice honorees and I have a note here that says when I say that you should clap all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> because this is an exciting time to be champions for everyone's right to read. And as one of my colleagues says often, free people read freely. And so you are the ones that are on the front lines of that. And I've read about your very effective and very creative literacy practices, inspiring youth to read by increasing their access to books or connecting them with the authors and illustrators, ensuring that under-resourced youth and young adults are engaged meaningfully with text and empowering communities throughout the world to be proud of their identity and culture through literacy. And there's much more and you're doing great work. So thank you to all of you who have traveled from across the country and even the world to be with us today. We really appreciate it. And although he can't be with us today, I want to thank Mr. David M. Rubenstein for his ongoing generous support of the Literacy Awards Program. With his support, the Library of Congress Literacy Awards Program has awarded more than $3 million to more than 180 organizations in 39 countries over the past 11 years. And we owe a special debt of gratitude also to the wonderful individuals who serve on our Literacy Awards Advisory Board. Thank you for giving so generously of your time and your expertise. And always the recommendations to me for the awards and recognition are evidence of the expertise that the board members have. And I even have worked with some of them over the years. So we're very fortunate. Before, 
outline the award winners, I just wanted to say a few words about the Library of Congress and my hopes for you today and beyond. First, look around you in the room. This conference is really special and I hope that you will make connections. And you're going to be spending the day with authors and literary scholars and representatives from organizations from around the world who are doing this wonderful work. And so this is a unique chance for you to connect and learn from each other. So be brave. If you don't know many people, go up to them. Use a lot of the food breaks. Those are great mixers. <laughs> and just make connections and be open to possible collaborations. And then, and this is a special plea for me, from me, think about your connection to the Library of Congress and what that could be. Because earlier this month, we released our 2024 to 2028 strategic plan and we titled it, A Library for All. And the first words in the strategic plan are, the Library of Congress is a place for you. And so we are committed to expanding access and enhancing our services, strengthening our capacity to foster innovation, building lifelong and meaningful connections to our users, not only of today, but tomorrow. And that's where the literacy awards in your organizations can be very helpful because we know we need partnerships and collaborations with organizations such as the ones you represent. So if you could, and be open and honest, please, and let Leon, Leanne Potter know, if you don't want to say it in one of the sessions, uh, but what could the Library of Congress do to continue to be a part of your environment and helping others to have the opportunity that literacy could provide. So if you will work with me, because this is my first virtual uh, being able to present and do this to honor the 2023 Library of Congress Literacy Awards, we're going to begin by honoring and recognizing the 15 successful practices honorees. And they've already received their certificates during registration, right, Leanne? That's right, they have. All right, good, good, good. So could you please stand up as I call your organization's name? And you may take a seat when I announce the next recipient. And guess, this is the hardest part. Let's save our applause for the end. You know, all uh, awards programs say that. And sometimes it doesn't happen, so I'm just saying it, but if you feel the urge, go for it. Our first recipient is from New Zealand, and I hope I am pronouncing it correctly. Akar Ateo Rock in New Zealand. Would you please stand up? And you can go. Next, Book Love Foundation in New Hampshire. Book Spring in Texas. Building Tomorrow in Indiana. Compassion Books in Vietnam. Dominican Literacy Center in Illinois. Get Lit Words Ignite Universe program in California. An Open Book Foundation in Washington, D.C. Pakistan Alliance for Girls Education, Page in Pakistan. Promoting Equality in African Schools, or Peace, serving Uganda and Zambia. The Queensboro Public Library's Voices of Queens podcast in New York. 
the Rio Grande Valley Literacy Center in Texas, the Virginia Children's Book Festival in Virginia, Wise Zambia Serving Zambia, and you saying Sulinama's collaboration with Inovesa in Indonesia. And we've already given applause individually, but let's give a collective one, like it says we're supposed to do. <laughs> and thank you all, and please excuse any uh, mispronunciations. And everyone will have an opportunity to engage with the self spoke practices honorees during the conference exhibit this afternoon, and that's going to be uh, really exciting. So please take that opportunity. And now it's time to honor this year's top prize recipients. I mentioned that David L. M. Rubenstein is not able to be here, but he has established a special prize, the David M. Rubenstein Prize, that's awarded for an outstanding and measurable contribution to increasing literacy levels to an organization based either inside or outside of the United States. The organization has demonstrated exceptional and sustained depth in its commitment to the advancement of literacy. And the organization meets the highest standards of excellence in its operations and services. And it's my pleasure to award the News Literacy Project based in Washington, DC, for their work on news literacy education in the United States with the 2023 David M. Rubenstein Prize. Please stand up. Now the 2023 American Prize is awarded to an organization based in the United States for making a significant Well, I was wondering. <laughs> I couldn't see. I said, well, everybody was looking a certain way. Yay! Thank you. And please take photos. Yes. Okay, you're good. We can move on to the American Prize now. <laughs> All right. So I know now that the American Prize winners are there in person. Yeah and will receive their prize because it's awarded to an organization based in the United States for making a significant and measurable contribution to increasing literacy levels in the United States and or the national awareness of the importance of literacy. And congratulations to the downtown boxing gym in Detroit, Michigan for receiving the 2023 American Prize Award. And we recognize your free athletic and academic program centered around literacy that helps students in Detroit succeed in the classroom. Congratulations. The 2023 International Prize is awarded to an organization that's based outside of the United States for their significant and measurable contribution to increasing literacy levels in a country outside of the United States. And it's my pleasure to award the World Reader. It's a Seattle-based EdTech nonprofit that increases access to reading materials in the global South with the International Prize. This is what you miss being virtual. I see you all looking very nicely over at the prize winners. People are smiling. And so that's next year. I hope I can be there with you in person because this truly is a wonderful opportunity for us to all connect globally about the importance of literacy and improving people's lives. So congratulations to our Literacy Award recipients and if you could just remember my two hopes for you today, that you make connections with each other 
and also think about what the Library of Congress can do to help you in your work because I believe we're stronger together. So thank you so much. And thank you, Leanne, for making it possible for me to be here in space. <laughs> I want to get the personal chance to say good morning and, and welcome. I am an advisory board member. And like many of you, I trust librarians. So in preparation for <laughs> introducing Mr. Salter, who goes by Chuck, I called a DC public school librarian who I know engages with a news literacy project. And here's what she told me. That is amazing that they won. I believe in what they're doing. With their support, I was able to create dynamic lessons to teach kids about false news, fake news, and actually accurate news. All of that from a primary source. So it's a great honor to be introducing Mr. Chuck Salter of the News Literacy Project. Chuck joined the NLP as its first ever chief operating officer in 2018 and was named president and COO in 2019. He became president and CEO on July 1st, 2022. Prior to joining the team, he spent nearly two decades working in the education space, particularly to advance opportunity in under-resourced communities as a teacher, a school leader, teacher union president, and as a senior executive with several national education organizations. Most recently, before NLP, he was president and CEO of Build Inc., a national youth entrepreneurship organization. To speak more about the successful practices of the News Literacy Project, Chuck. Good morning. Um, I guess we're going to set up the slideshow. Uh, so first, on behalf of the News Literacy Project, I do want to start by expressing immense pride uh, and gratitude uh, on behalf of the staff, the board of directors, and the thousands of educators that we serve each year uh, for the recognition of the Library of Congress. Um, it's truly an honor to accept the Rubenstein Prize and a privilege to be with you here today. Um, and actually, I was sharing with my colleagues, um, of course, this is a great honor. Um, when I was a teacher, I actually had to serve one year as our stand-in librarian. Um, and so I found that actually being here at the Library of Congress um, holds more personal weight for me than, than I was actually expecting this morning. So um, let's see if the clicker works. How about that? All right. So given that we're here to celebrate and share successful literacy practices, I thought I'd start my presentation with NLP's definition of literacy, or more specifically, news literacy. And you've probably heard of digital literacy, information literacy, cyber literacy, possibly even critical media literacy, and hopefully maybe even news literacy as well. Um, these are all disciplines in the larger field of media literacy. But at NLP, uh, we see news literacy as the foundational approach uh, to all other aspects of media literacy. And it's, it's defined by a few key elements. So namely, it has a pedagogy uh, that helps the learner know how to think about news and information and not what to think about any particular source. It emphasizes developing a healthy skepticism for the news um, without becoming cynical about the news. Uh, it is dedicated to the First Amendment, uh, specifically uh, its protection of a free press and its guarantee of a free press. And it has a nonpartisan focus on a very clear set of learning standards. It would probably be helpful to focus a bit on that last element, um, particularly the actual learning standards of news literacy. In short, what makes somebody news literate? So we have five standards, uh, five distinct learning standards uh, that our programs and our resources are designed to teach. And when mastered, uh, someone would be considered news literate. So they are uh, recognizing the role of a free press and what it plays, uh, the role it plays in a democracy, uh, generally as a watchdog on government and other centers of power, uh, developing a sense of personal responsibility when sharing information, 
or to the point, avoiding sharing disinformation. Uh, the ability to distinguish news from other types of information, uh, such as advertising, opinion, and propaganda, but also understanding the purpose of each of those types of information. The fourth is being able to identify the presence or absence of the qualities of standards-based journalism in pieces claiming to be legitimate news. And then finally, demonstrating news verification skills yourself, such as lateral reading and reverse image searches. So before we talk a bit more about NLP, our, our programs and our reach and our goals, um, I'd like to take just a minute to talk about why news literacy is such an important type of literacy. So we've all seen it, the headlines. It seems every media outlet is now talking about dis and misinformation. I think the events uh, in Israel over the past two weeks have proven that disinformation uh, comes at us at a volume and a speed unlike any time in human history. And it is true, though, that this existence of this type of misleading isn't new. Um, but we do live in the most complex information landscape in human history. And when you put all that together, we have a recipe uh, for complete chaos and, quite frankly, the breakdown of our public dialogue. Uh, this can affect people's health, their finances, and even their lives. But most importantly, if citizens can't separate fact from fiction in the news and information they receive, their ability to participate in self-government is diminished. And our democratic process is placed at extreme risk. You know, I'm often asked, um, how is NLP going to get rid of disinformation? And, you know, honestly, that is the wrong question. Um, because the answer is we, we never will. Uh, disinformation has existed for as long as humans have communicated. We're just better at creating and spreading it uh, than ever before. And for those who would suggest that government regulation is the answer uh, to ending disinformation, I'd remind them of two things. First, the First Amendment uh, gets in the way of a lot of that. But secondly, the fact of the matter is in every country, in nearly every country that has passed a law prohibiting or punishing disinformation, without fail, the first targets of that law were critics of the government. Um, and so the right question is, how do we equip the individual to better navigate this information landscape, uh, to better sort fact from fiction? And we think that a big part of that answer is news literacy. So consider these two numbers. Um, according to a recent study by the Stanford History Education Group, 96% of students surveyed failed to challenge the credibility of a source they were given. They accepted it on blind faith. And 50% of students surveyed classified unverified facts as strong evidence for a certain claim without checking it themselves. So young people might be digital natives, um, but they are hopelessly ill-equipped um, at first to actually sort through the flood of information that they receive on a daily basis. Uh, and honestly, statistics about adults um, actually <laughs> aren't that much better. Um, just recently, I think just this week, the National Academies of Science uh, just published a study showing that 75% of adults thought they were better at detecting disinformation than they actually were uh, when tested. So what can we do about disinformation and, and how does NLP promote news literacy? Uh, we consider ourselves a dual mandate organization. We work both within the education space and also with adult populations. And we do that because as an organization, uh, just a couple years ago, we committed ourselves to actually building a movement to create a more news literate country. And we feel that both approaches are necessary to get a job of that size done. But for today's purposes and in the interest of time, I know we have time cards in front of me, um, I'm just going to focus on the work that we do in the education space. So our ultimate goal is that students are taught news literacy as a matter of course before they graduate high school. Um, because these decisions are formalized at the state level, we work in partnership 
with state level and district level leaders to structurally advance the teaching of news literacy. But we also train and support individual educators uh, to integrate news literacy instruction into their already existing curriculum. So on average each year, we work with about 15,000 educators in all 50 states who reach 2 million students every year. Okay, so our principal and most successful educational tool is a self-contained e-learning platform called Checkology. So this platform contains 19 interactive lessons led by industry leaders and experts alongside dozens of extension activities teaching the principles and practices of news literacy. Uh, the platform is fully customizable so the educator can decide what skills their students learn in what order, uh, what level of reinforcement they get before completing various work assignments and assessments. And the educator can even decide whether the students work independently on a computer, laptop, uh, or tablet, or instruction is given uh, in the whole group. And while the program is designed to facilitate the teaching of news literacy, we've actually aligned each lesson uh, to state and national standards of a variety of different subjects, including English and language arts. So educators from a variety of disciplines uh, can more easily integrate news literacy into their instructional plan. Uh, and best of all, Checkology and all of our resources, which we'll talk about in a minute, are available to use free of charge. Um, this is a free curriculum. And because we also collect anonymous student assessment data in real time, uh, we know that Checkology works. So over half a million students have used the platform so far. And in our most recent data collection, uh, among the impact the program had on news li literacy learning standards, we found uh, three really impressive things. After completing the program, 75% of students had a better understanding of the First Amendment, which is a 38 percentage point jump. 72% uh, of the students could recognize when a post or a news piece didn't provide credible evidence. And you'll remember that only 4% of the students did that in the Stanford survey. And 68% demonstrated a recognition of the need to verify facts before sharing news or information. And so all of these metrics showed tremendous growth and um, in some of our most critical learning standards. Uh, but beyond that data and our metrics, um, we, we highly value uh, teacher and student feedback. And so I'd like to play a very short video of what just a few of our thousands of educators and students have to say about their experience with Checkology. After a few months of teaching news literacy, my students are readily able to discern a piece of information is meant to persuade. Is this propaganda? Is this an advertisement? So we think this one is a persuasion. Now I'll take a look at a couple of the news sites or the news posts and I'll go and look at other news accounts that I follow and I'll be like, okay, what is the common information that all of them are saying? I feel a lot more confident now when I do go on social media. I feel like if younger people were to learn more about this at a younger age, we would understand how to figure out what's real and what's fake. It really helped me see the difference between fake news and real news. I had to stop looking at some websites because I realized they didn't really cite their source or have any things that supported their reasoning. Now, after using Checkology, I feel a lot more informed and confident because I can actually see which is fake and which is not fake. I feel that the news literacy education I've provided with my students has been transformative for them. Students are able to have more complex and in-depth conversations about the types of news that they are consuming. Do you have some sources that you're thinking about? I feel like not only am I teaching a class, I feel like I'm training kids to make this democracy work. Our democracy depends on it, and I believe that with all my heart. I'm trying to get kids to, to realize that too. I turned 18 at the beginning of the school year, and I did vote for the first time. It was exciting because now I felt like my voice can be somewhat heard and a part of all these other millions of people who are voting. I think news literacy should be wider spread. This is a skill that I will not forget. I'll probably even try to teach it to others. 
I think it's really important the whole globe is really news literate. No matter what the country is, everyone needs to know what's true. I think this class changed me in a very big way. I felt like it helped me realize that I actually had a voice. I wish that it would help other people, other young students actually figure out that they have a voice too. So just to close out sort of our, our high level description of, of how we're promoting our, our unique type of literacy, um, I wanted to mention a few other programs and resources that we offer to help facilitate um, teaching news literacy beyond just the Czechology uh, curriculum. So first we offer a newsletter called The SIFT uh, to educators. It's a weekly newsletter which provides uh, educators with ready-made prompts and activities to integrate news literacy skills into their teaching uh, based on current real-world examples. Uh, and we have an online resource library that is filled with materials uh, also you can use to integrate news literacy, um, but without the need for a computer lab uh, or individual laptops or high-speed internet, because unfortunately, uh, that is still very much a reality for too many schools in the United States. Um, but beyond teaching resources, we created uh, Newslet Nation, uh, which is a national community of practice to support those teaching news literacy. Uh, and that's largely driven by a network of news literacy ambassadors. Uh, these are expert practitioners that support educators on a more local basis. Uh, we also offer a series of professional development webinars. And now we have an online news literacy certificate program for educators desiring uh, a more self-directed approach. Uh, to professional development. And if that were not enough, um, to support our work uh, to accelerate the formal adoption of news literacy instruction, currently only three states uh, require that media literacy be taught. Uh, two years ago, we launched uh, the News Literacy Fellowship Program. Uh, this is where districts from around the country apply for a two-year fellowship, uh, during which time NLP supports them to plan and implement a district-wide news literacy curriculum program for their students. Uh, we currently have eight districts in eight separate states in this program. So in addition to providing the core curriculum and the teaching frameworks uh, for news literacy, we work on multiple fronts to support and develop news literacy educators and to expand the teaching of news literacy in the hopes that one day it will be considered um, as vital a part of education as traditional literacy, math, and, and science are. So I've mentioned a few times uh, that we work at national scale um, and supporting educators in all 50 states. And while that is true, I share this map uh, to visually highlight how far we've gotten in building the infrastructure needed to expand uh, the teaching of news literacy and to support those uh, who are. Um, so two programs I just mentioned, the, the Newslet Nation Ambassadors and our District Fellowship Program, you can see they largely overlap as we concentrate our extracurricular activities beyond uh, Czechology and curriculum into a number of a few key states. Uh, so in closing, um, we were asked uh, to share any ideas we hope that you would take away from hearing about our organization, and I can tell you I have a few. Um, thoughts. And, and the first is that um, I hope everyone realizes that news literacy is in fact a vital type of literacy. Um, and that there is something uh, as a society and as individuals that we can and must do about the challenge of disinformation. Um, everyone can become more news literate and we believe that work begins in our schools. So again, thank you to the Library of Congress for this great recognition, and uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. We're gonna move into Q&A, and um, before we, we dive in, I just wanna share, I think, congratulations again. Um, child of immigrants who moved from Taiwan to, to DC and um, very much uh, wanted to give me a chance to, to learn how to be literate and navigate the world around me. And I think that what you're doing is so, so, so deeply a part of, of that work to do it right. And uh, so uh, our, our team at the, at the library is gonna come around and um, hand you a microphone uh, if you have a question. Um, but before we move there, would other folks from the News Literacy Project please raise your hand in case anyone else during breaks 
wants to have a conversation and go deeper. Congratulations. And um, I will kick us off by first asking what's next, uh, but please uh, raise your hand and, and our team will come around. Sure, uh, what's next? Um, I did mention this briefly, but just the interest of time didn't go into it. Um, we're taking everything we've learned over the past 15 years working with educators and students and now working with the broader public. Um, because a lot of people recognized uh, the good that we were doing in the world, um, but they would come up to us and say, but the house is on fire right now and we need to help people who aren't in school, um, who are beyond school age. And so um, we've developed a series of resources um, and a series of, of learning opportunities, much like we do for teachers, uh, but for the general public. And we created a new website, uh, it's called Rumor Guard, where people can go and actually see the latest rumors that have been debunked. And if that's all anyone does on the site, that's great, we've done our job, people can learn the truth. But um, if people wanna spend more time on the site, they can do many things. They can actually learn why it's not true and how we know that it's not true. Um, if they wanna spend a little bit more time, uh, they can learn how to do it themselves um, and, and start fact checking uh, like the professional fact checkers do. And then the fourth thing we let them do is if they're so inclined, they can sign up and actually share these posts online. And our hope is, is that we build a critical mass of people who are sharing debunked rumors on social media to actually impact the algorithm that started the rumor in the first place. Um, and so it, it gives people something very active to do to push back against disinformation because right now what we found is most people are kind of running for the hills saying like there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, but in fact, the answer lies with the individual uh, being able to do it. And so this is an entirely new line of work for us uh, over the past two years, um, but it's something that we think is needed and we're pretty excited about. Um, I'm, gl I, I'm very glad you mentioned the last point because, and I didn't know if you wanted people to know, but when I read your application, I got so interested in it and I realized that I didn't have to be a school district. I could be just me, an older retired person and sign up myself with Rumor Guard and learn too. So I just wanted to urge other people in the room um, to sign up yourself. Oh, thank you. One, one thing I'll say about that is uh, since we have partnerships with districts and states uh, around the country to help our, our educational program, uh, when it comes to reaching adults and the broader public, it is entirely key for us to form partnerships with membership and affinity organizations. So one of our, our proudest partnerships that we hold right now is with AARP, that we're their official misinformation fighting partner, not misinformation partner, but fighting partner. Um, and so we're designing, we're designing resources and, and, and learning experiences um, for their members. The last uh, webinar that we had actually had uh, over 10,000 people uh, come to it to learn how to be more news literate. So if you know of any organizations like that, we will partner with anyone and everyone who's interested. So. And for the international folks, AARP is the organization here in the US that works with older adults. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your work. Um, we at Queens Public Library actually pre-pandemic have worked with you at a public right. library, which was great that you were able to do a program for us. Yep. Um, because you're right, it's more than just in the schools. My question, I guess, is a little bit broader than maybe your mission, but clearly here in the United States, we've seen some school level curriculum mm -hmm. that are actually putting disinformation into their textbooks. Yeah. And while it's not what is happening today, it is actually, you know, it's actually literally whitewashing um, uh, history um, from the past that actually does affect the way people think in the future. Um, just a general comment from you all. Sure. Um, it's terrible. That's the official comment. Um, uh, first off, for the library, um, when we partnered with you all, uh, we weren't, I'll be honest, we weren't ready to partner outside of schools. And so I think our conclusion was our program really doesn't work for libraries, but we're ready now. So if, if libraries want to partner with us, we, we can certainly do that. Um, to your question, you're right. Look, as a former teacher, superintendent, all of those things, um, and kind of an educator at, at heart for life, um, I'll just say in the, the safety of this space, um, what's happening in regards to curriculum and books and all of that is just, I think, offensive. 
um, and it's, it's almost unbelievable. Um, as an organization, you know, we've actually had this debate internally. Um, we thread a very, or we walk a very thi fine line um, because we partner with districts in deep red Alabama and Texas as well as California and Oregon. And, you know, our organization and our philosophy is, is strictly um, nonpartisan as much as it pains us as individuals or possibly even as an organization, we generally don't make statements on things that don't directly relate to, well, this relates, but that don't directly impact what we're doing with teachers because um, one thing that we've had to start doing um, is developing uh, support systems that's part of Newslet Nation, but also just resources in general, talking points, uh, letters, you know, form, form letters for teachers to use who are being attacked by parents simply for teaching news literacy. Because they're like, unless you tell my kids that, you know, this news outlet is credible, then you're just biased in all of this. And it's, it's being pulled into this fray. And so we work very hard to make sure that <laughs> we're not pulling ourselves into any more, um, regardless of what our, our personal opinions are. But as you mentioned, it's, it's terrible. It's just a terrible trend. Quick question for you. Um, Evan Hagland with Y Zambia. So I have to ask, disinformation is not a, just a North American issue, but no, it's not. international. Does your curriculum, have you adapted it so that it could be used outside of North America? So it's a great question. Um, we actually have, I think Checkology has been used by educators in over 100 countries um, because it's free to use. You just go to getcheckology.org and you can, you can sign up. It's, it's just that easy. Um, and because it's fully customizable, um, you know, teachers can make it what it is. Like there are definitely some, some uh, lessons there about the First Amendment, which, you know, would mean nothing. Uh, outside the United States necessarily. Um, and so teachers tend to skip that. We've been approached several times about creating uh, versions of Czechology for international markets, um, certain languages or, or specific countries. And the answer to that is um, up to this point, it's just prohibitively expensive. Um, you know, honestly, we've spent uh, almost 10 years and millions of dollars developing the platform where it is now. Um, we know how to do it and we actually know what it would cost to like create a different version and we can't afford it. And so far anyone who's approached us, you know, can't provide the funding either. Um, but it is something we would consider um, and it's something we'd be interested in. What we do in the meantime is all the other resources that I mentioned um, that, that aren't, you know, internet dependent. Um, they're available to anyone as well. And we've actually received several requests to have them translated. And our only request is that one, you, you keep our logo on it, um, you know, and give us credit, and two, we want a copy of it because we actually collect our, our resources in all these different languages. We think it's fantastic. Um, and so that's, that's probably the primary way we interact with folks working outside the United States. I'm wondering if you ever use historical sources. So do you ever guide students to look at misinformation, yellow journalism, et cetera, that may have existed, um, you know, 100 years ago? So which occurs, which seems to me to take some of the emotions away from um, this whole process mm -hmm. because people are looking at things that have passed and not looking at current misinformation. Right. Um, we do both. Um, we do we do current because that's you know kids will see something they saw online you know and, and they'll relate to it uh, more readily, um, but we do look to the past. In fact, you know our philosophy around this is um, you know oftentimes people will paint media with too broad a brush and they'll say the media does this and we're like well what are you talking about right? And so you first have to separate standard-based journalism versus everything else. Um, and what we what we also teach our students is even when you're dealing with standards-based journalism. Um, it's okay, and in fact, it's required to be news literate to actually be skeptical um, of those sources because they make mistakes. Um, they fail to, to always live up to the standards that they have, and it's okay. Um, and, and we call that out, and we have historical examples. And in fact, one of our newest lessons on Czechology is actually called um, the history of harm and distrust. 
Um, and we acknowledge that there are several communities in the United States that have suffered um, due to biased news coverage. But we do focus for this lesson on the experience of black Americans and how, how media coverage in the past um, really damaged uh, communities even to this day. And so we're very open you know, to the idea, anyone who comes to us and says, oh, you're just shills for like mainstream media, it's just not the case. Um, we're, we're pretty objective, <laughs> it's our job uh, to teach people how to be that way as well. And we do face like historically um, where, and even currently where journalism falls down, uh, where, where standards-based journalism uh, falls down. It's, most people think it's just the dichotomy that we're only talking about disinformation sites or yellow journalism or now pink slime journalism is what it's called. That's a whole different category. You still have to deal with standards-based journalism, that there's still thinking that needs to go on uh, from the consumer. We have time for a couple more questions. You mentioned that there are three states that currently require media literacy. Can you tell us what those states are? Oh, I can. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's a little bit complicated, as anything with legislation would be, um, but right, because you can look through and see that there's probably about 10 states that have passed something to do with media literacy, but most of the states have passed laws that require it to go through a curricular drafting process and a committee and all, and it will take years, but they're on the right track. There are three states who require it to be taught right now. Um, the first was Illinois. Uh, the second was uh, Delaware, or excuse me, New Jersey, and then Delaware very quickly thereafter. And the reason we've gotten into the work of accelerating that process and helping other states uh, begin to require news literacy is we were content, especially being a nonpartisan organization, not really wanting to get into the legislative fray. Um, we thought that this would just start happening like dominoes, um, and it really hasn't. And so we figured we'll use our subject matter expertise and our reputation to help others in a state who are working to make this happen, make it happen faster. Uh, but right now, those are the three. Hi, uh, my name is Naval, I'm on the board. I was a journalist before I was an educator. I work with families and schools across the country. Um, do you have anything on your, in your programming that shows um, headlines changing over time? Hmm. So, um, no, we don't have a tool that like people can put in a, right. a headline and do that, but we do have several lessons that focus on um, uh, how folks can do that themselves. Like we haven't built a tool for it. Um, and we focus specifically on um, social media <laughs> that can change, um, but anyone who, who, who understands social media knows that it never really goes away, what you originally posted, or whether you're a news outlet or a, a blogger. Um, and so that's, that's really where we focus our attention on the changing headline uh, um, issue. I'm, I was particularly interested in what you said about um, mainstream media, standards-based journalism, and being skeptical when you look at that and how headlines could change over time and if kids, if we're giving kids the tools to look at that as well. Yeah, and, and in fact, one of the standards uh, that we outline, there's seven for you know, standards-based journalism, is the ability um, and the willingness to openly correct themselves and change things and, um, and make a big deal about when they're wrong and change it. And you know, one of the questions we have students ask is, if a source that you prefer is not doing that, you know, you'll have to ask why. Because, um, you know, well, you know this, but, um, News is the first draft of history, <laughs> um, especially in breaking news situations. Often the information is incomplete or wrong. Um, but you will see that standards-based journalism is constantly updating what they report and admitting when what they reported or holding off altogether before they know for sure. Um, and we just we caution folks um, to say if your news outlet is not doing that, um, you, you might want to think about where you're getting your news. Great, one more. We have another question here. Oh, sorry. Oh, this, this side of the room. All right. Did we have one over here? Hello, I really appreciate uh, your organization. Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> my question is, do you all have any um, guidance or resources for policymakers or those folks who are on the committees writing curriculum frameworks or 
the people who wrote like the C3 framework for social studies um, that that is on your website or accessible to whether it's folks at uh, SEAs or the technical assistance providers that partner with them to do some of that work? Mm -hmm. uh, we do, uh, is the short answer. And in fact, we, we've just uh, developed um, our first teaching framework for news literacy, um, which we're really proud of. Uh, but also, we even, we've been so um, presumptuous to draft um, model legislation <laughs> for people if they're interested. Um, and essentially what it is is the Illinois bill, uh, which is so, it's a half a page. Um, and it's pretty specific. It, it simply states that uh, every school district has to figure it out themselves, like they left it to the school districts, but that students must be taught media literacy and they actually define five things that we approve of. Uh, we had nothing to do with the bill, but we approve of it. Um, and it says, before you graduate from high school, and do it now, you know, starting this year. And we just tell states, look, it can work. If it works in Illinois, it'll work anywhere. And that's really what we're trying to push. But yes, for the for for the for the deeper conversation, um, you know, and and the more protracted process of, of drafting, you know, standards and curriculum and all that, we have those as well. Um, yeah. Judy, there's one more question from the gentleman behind John. Hi, um, thanks for that great presentation. Um, it seems that you've created an app that has claimed a digital space that was unoccupied, but you said that it's been built with at the cost of millions of dollars. So I'm wondering, um, who is your competition and what do they offer? <laughs> so um, there are a lot of folks uh, who are doing good work in this space. Um, a little bit at a time. Uh, Common Sense Media is actually a partner of ours. They're a great organization. They devote some, yeah, some time to this, but also um, part of their media literacy package is to promote Czechology. <laughs> like they actually say, here's where you can go. So as far as we know at this point, um, and we do, we keep a careful uh, watch on this, uh, we're the only one, we're the only organization solely dedicated to, to news literacy and to getting it into schools and to supporting educators do that. And so we take a, a, a degree of pride with that expertise. Um, we've been doing it for 15 years and no one else has been. Um, and, and so we don't really see people as competitors. It's a really big country. <laughs> there's a lot of needs, there's a lot of teachers. Um, but you know, just as a point of pride, we do think we do it the best. Um, and because we've been at it for so long and it's all that we do. So um, there are really good resources out there. Um, but of course, our job is to promote our own. Great, I'm gonna close this out first by adding to your list of three and say as a, wearing my other hat as a member of our Board of Education here in DC, we just revised our social study standards. In DC. Have added news literacy to it. As a DC resident, I'm sorry, yes, a state, fourth state, yes, <laughs> DC. Yeah. Um, we'll close out with 30 seconds to ask, how can we help? You know, um, we love advocates, um, like any nonprofit. I'm not gonna ask people for money here, which I know all nonprofits need, but um, simply you can go on to our resources, use them, get your friends to use them. If you're members of organizations that you think this might be of interest to, um, we're happy to talk to anyone and partner with just about anyone. Um, we're trying to build a movement, and we know that, that uh, you know, the 45 staff members uh, of the News Literacy Project won't be able to do it alone. And so any way you want to get involved, um, it's all there on our website, and we welcome everyone. Thank you, congratulations. Thank you. are on there. So a little while ago, I was chatting with some of my friends about this year's Literacy Award winners. And I am mentioned the American Prize winner, the downtown boxing gym. And one of my friends looked at me and said, did you say 
boxing gym? And I said, yes, the downtown boxing gym. And I explained to them all about the program. Now, in case you're wondering, a boxing gym yourself, today we have the pleasure of hearing about this interesting and outstanding program from the people who know the place firsthand and play a role in its success. So first, I'd like you to meet Kali Sweeney, who had an idea born of his own experience plus a strong desire to help others. And he is the founder of the Downtown Boxing Gym. Katie Solomon is the Programs Director and Chief Operating Officer. Katie has a BA and an MA from Michigan State and is taught in both the Detroit and the Chicago Public Schools. And then we have Skylar Burkhart, the Data and Literacy Manager, and her work is to ensure that every student, especially those in grades three to eight, receive all the support they need to score at above, read at above or below grade, above grade level. And she's had a lot of experience coaching and teaching writing. So I ask you to please welcome Kelly, Katie, and Skyler, the winner that represent the winners of this year's American Prize the Downtown Boxing Gym. Good morning, good afternoon. I, I lost track of time. <laughs> um, um, my name is Kali Sweeney. I'm the founder of the uh, Downtown Boxing Gym in Detroit, Michigan. Um, my journey started out, by the third grade, I, I realized something. In the third grade, I couldn't read. Fourth grade, I couldn't read fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh, all the way to the 12th grade year. I couldn't read, write, spell at all, period. And they just gave me a good report card every year and passed me along. Anytime I would act out in this class, I didn't have the words to say that I couldn't read. I didn't have the vocabulary. I didn't know how to ask for help. So I would just act out and they would do what I expected them to do right on time, which is kick me right out. And I would go home and watch cartoons or go watch whatever was on TV, Jeopardy, or whatever and wait for my friends to come home. But, it did, but when I did hear stuff from the people that was in the classrooms, they would tell me, you're not going to even be able to be a garbage man. You're not going to be able to work at a fast food restaurant. You're going to be dead in jail before you're 21. So they created this narrative in my head. And so I used to go home and do push-ups and say, when I get ready to go to prison, I'm going to be ready. When I get shot, when I, get, I wonder what it's going to feel like when I get shot. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die young anyway. It don't matter. By the time I turn 18, I already been shot once. By the time 19, I got shot again. I got stabbed. I was just like, hey, this is, this, this is life. And so I hit the streets hard until somebody asked me and said, you know, the rest of the world don't live like that. And I was like, get out of here. And they showed me all my friends. They all were dead for real or in jail for real. And I could see them. They pointed them out on a the picture. They said, what you want to do with your life? The only thing I could think of is the most terrifying thing in the world for me was I wasn't scared of the police. I was ready for that. I was born. They, they taught me about that. I was ready to go to jail. I was ready, I wasn't scared to die. They pulled guns on me. I seen guys get shot close range. I don't care about that. I wasn't scared of none of that. The only thing that struck fear in my heart was a book. Because if, if, if you found out I couldn't read, I shook in my, to my core. I would go blind looking at a piece of paper. A piece of paper scared me. A book scared the death out of me because I couldn't read and I wanted to so bad. So I wanted to change my life. So I went back to school and I learned to read. And it opened up so many doors for me. I'm not the best reader right now. I still can't spell hardly, but hey, I have fun trying. I love it now. I, I spend most of my time with books. So thank you for this reward. Thank you to my staff and my, my, my families and the team. Everybody, I can't do it without them. We do this together as a team. So I let them take it from here. Um, thanks for that introduction, Karen, and thanks to Kali for sharing your story. Um, we don't see bad kids, we see kids who haven't been heard yet. Um, today we're going to dive into the yet of this statement and show you how DBG creates a space to find, help students find their voices to use, use them to write their own narratives for their lives. 
and how focusing programming around human dignity has had a profound and lasting impact on our society. Um, but again, I just want to take a moment and echo Kali in that we're so honored to be up here. It's so amazing as a former ELA teacher to be like at the Library of Congress winning the Literacy Award. So um, I know I speak for Skylar as well. We're just, we're super, super honored. It's an amazing bucket list item, so thank you. Um, all right, so we do a ton of things at DBG. Um, we do math and literacy intervention. We have a STEAM lab where our kids compete in robotics tournaments. We raise chickens. We have a 3D printer where they're constantly printing new cool little gadgets. Um, we have woodworking going on. Um, we actually were recently awarded um, a five-year research grant with the National Science Foundation to document the impact our STEAM lab has had on students' success in entering and being successful in STEAM careers. Um, and the goal is to be able to share the impact that we've had with the, with the global academic community. So that's something we're also really proud about. Um, our kids attend all sorts of camps and summer programs. We have our own summer program where the kids get to pick their own electives that staff then design programming around. And yes, we do do boxing. <laughs> um, we do a ton of other athletic programs too though. Um, we use athletics to challenge students to discipline their minds and bodies, build resilience, um, build self-esteem, and create a safe space for camaraderie and connection. We start with boxing as the hook to get kids through the door, and then we build on that excitement from there. Because clearly, we're up here winning a literacy award, books come before boxing, and we train kids for life. Now, I could go on and on about all the things that we do, but really what it boils down to is the powerful combination of individualized intervention, enrichment programming, wraparound services, and mentorship that's built on the strong relationships that we build with our students and parents, the entire family, year after year after year. We have over 800 students in our network, starting at age eight and supporting well into adulthood. We're different because we put the student's voice at the center of everything we do. So that means hearing them when they express an interest in a new thing that they want to try or a new field that they want to go into, and then designing a program around that interest. But it also means hearing them when the program's not really going that great and we need to adapt and change it. So we iterate until the program is right. We find out what barriers are in the way for our families and then the root causes, and then we work to remove them, which is why everything at DBG has always been free of cost, including transportation. Um, Kali kind of alluded to this quote, but um, he has a quote I want to share that captures why seeing youth as bad or incapable is the wrong approach. He says, looking back at my own life, somebody created a narrative for me because I couldn't read and write. Narratives were being given to us that we would be dead or in jail. It's our job as residents of these communities to demand more for ourselves and our students. So speaking of students, I thought what better way to really show you who we are and what we do than to take you through an example of a student in our program. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call him Kevin today. And bear with me, but I'm going to ask everybody to kind of walk back in your minds with me to March of 2021. So globally, we're all in this pandemic. In Detroit, that meant we were a, a little over a year into a fully virtual, synchronous learning only school year. And for us at DBG, that meant we doubled our staff, tripled our programming hours so that our students could come and do their virtual school all day with us and with our mentorship and their parents could still go to work. Um, and Kevin and I, at this point in the story, are sitting at these couches that overlook our athletic programs. Um, we're sitting there in complete silence and uh, this is because we're on day three of him just being completely disengaged from virtual school, like head down. At this point, he's not even logging into virtual school anymore. And I'm trying a tactic with him, and I'm starting to panic a little bit because I, um, it's not really working yet. And I had told him, like, I don't care if we have to sit here in silence until 11 PM. We're, you're telling me today what's wrong, what's going on with virtual school, why are you not engaged so that we can figure out and get you back involved. Um, and we're just going to sit here in silence. I'll drive you home myself if I have to. And um, an hour into it, he's still, he's just silent, not saying anything. So I'm starting to panic a little bit. Like, am I going to have to text my husband that I'm going to be home late for dinner and bedtime because I'm going to have to be driving Kevin home at 11 p.m. And then I'm going to have to figure out a new tactic to try again tomorrow. But thankfully, um, about 15 minutes later, 
Kevin slowly started to whisper something. And he just, I scooched a little closer because I couldn't hear him. I said, what did you say? And he just said, it's too hard and started sobbing. And I'm talking like full body shaking sobs that lasted quite a while. And once he was done crying, he just started to pour out how hard virtual school was for him. Like he's like, Coach Katie, I can't figure out where the submit button is because for my ELA class it's green and in the bottom left corner, but for my science class it's blue and in the top right corner. And speaking of science, I had these five tabs open for my science class, but then I accidentally exited out of them, couldn't figure out how to open them back up. And then by the time I did figure out how to open them back up, my teacher on my Zoom class, she's already on to social studies. Now I missed out on this really cool science activity that they were all doing. And on and on and on he went. We sat there and I just listened to him and I could visibly see a weight being lifted off. And so this is where DBG does what DBG does best. We create individualized plans to meet students right where they are and remove whatever barriers are in the way so that they can put in the work to do what they need to do to get where they need to be. So for Kevin, that meant the very next morning my team was on a phone call with his classroom teacher because we knew from our internal assessments that he was only reading at a second grade level, but he's sitting in a fifth grade class for eight hours staring at a screen all day. And so we needed to get on the same page with her as like, what can we do differently for homework and for um, schoolwork? And we at DBG have the time and freedom to go back in time and meet Kevin exactly where he's at at second grade while the teachers don't have that time and freedom in the school. So that's exactly what we did. Next, we got together with his mom and increased his literacy intervention schedule from two sessions a week to four with our partners, one of our many literacy partners, Center for Success Network. And we knew that Kevin loved outer space. So like that night, I'm ordering Amazon Prime next day delivery every second grade uh, level outer space book I can find. And then our STEAM lab coordinator um, developed these mini lessons that were hands-on at a second grade level, highly engaging for Kevin because he's obsessed with planets and everything outer space, NASA, to give him like little brain breaks where he's still learning and engaged, but a break from like the intensive, rigorous intervention plan that we had him going on. We hyped him up and we created space for him so he's able to relax and start enjoying schoolwork again. And now today, um, Kevin is in eighth grade and it's only October and he's already reading at an end of eighth grade level. So, yeah. <laughs> So in a little over three years, he went from a second grade reading level to an eighth grade reading level. And he's even helping out as a math tutor, as you can see in this picture, in our elementary school room. He got so invested in our math um, intervention program that he offered and asked our elementary coordinator if he could come back when he didn't have homework and help get the elementary school students like engaged and going on that intervention program. So, um, you know, Kevin was able to do the work because he had the time and the space and the freedom at DBG to actually do the work and get to where he needed to be. Um, programs like DBG existing are really important because we all know in this room that Kevin is not the only one struggling like this. He's an example of hundreds of thousands of kids nationwide and for us in Detroit you can see the stats are not great. In fact, if we zoom out a little bit and look at Michigan as a whole, for the past 14 years, nearly every other state across this country has made gains in literacy, even during COVID. And literacy, continue, Michigan continues to test in the bottom 10 um, across the country. But at DBG, on average, over the years, our third grade class starts at about 35% being on grade level. So we are a little higher than the city stats. But by the end of just one school year, Already, 77% of our third graders are back on grade level. So then imagine where they go when they're with us year after year after year because students stay in our program well into adulthood. We're also super proud of our 100% high school graduation rate. Uh, and this is what makes our why so important. We have a lot of work to do as a society to demand, dismantle these systems that are no longer serving our students. And we're paving the way for what that looks like at DBG. So I'm going to let Skylar dig into a little more detail about how we define literacy and the specifics around our approach. Thanks, Katie. After hearing Kevin's story, the statistics about Detroit are a serious gut punch. And I want to acknowledge the emotions that we might be feeling from that. 
Because we're all here, we know how important literacy is, but if we don't acknowledge our own personal feelings, they can start to take over the narrative of our students. Our own goals, like we need to get these kids on reading level, can start to take over the goals of our students and consume them. If we had just looked at Kevin's reading level at the end of fifth grade, he would still be failing. All of his ways he had opened up with people, how he had learned about himself and the world, would have been lost under that statistic. DBG's work is dependent on hearing stories like Kevin's and so many different from his every single day. We believe that there's essential human dignity in allowing students the space to define their own needs, their own goals, and their own dreams. At DBG, thanks. <laughs> At DBG, we don't let statistics like a reading level define our work because where's the human dignity in that? Where's that story? This is why we redef redefine students to truly hear our students. At DBG, we define our literacy through the relationships which students are forming. Literacy is such an important avenue for learning about all different kinds of things and all different relationships. It helps us reflect on our own lives. It helps us connect with others and hear their perspectives. And we can learn all the facts about the world through literacy. So our mentorship approach at DBG is all about leveraging that connection that literacy and relationships share. Because one cannot grow without the other. It's not about investing in flashcards or the perfect worksheet. If we really want to make a difference in literacy, we need meaningful relationships with the people that we're serving. So let's take a closer look at three types of relationship that DBG supports in our students, how each of those relationships shape literacy in a lasting way, and how each helps us better hear our students at DBG. Of course, everything we do at DBG is centered in our students' own defined needs. But that work is also dependent on students having a healthy relationship with themselves. A student's self-confidence and belief that they can adapt and persevere is at the core of every single skill that they're developing with us. Think about Kevin's time in synchronous school. He was not able to make any growth in his literacy until he believed that within himself he had every single tool that he needed to succeed. And what's really cool is that as DBG is developing these literacy skills in our students, we're also providing an opportunity for them to learn more about themselves. We had an 11th grader this past year discover his passion for dermatology, not through one of our many career panels that we offer, but actually through a journal entry. The students had been asked to write about something they had spent a lot of time on, and he wrote about his skincare journey, something he had invested a lot of things into. <laughs> money in particular, but he was also really passionate about sharing all the things he learned with others. And prior to that journal entry, he had been kind of thinking about becoming a car mechanic, which would be really awesome if it was something he was passionate about, if he had spent any time working on a car before. But ultimately, we saw a huge change in him when we saw this light up of like, wow, dermatology, I had never even considered that for myself. And so immediately the pieces started to move at DBG and he's since interned at a local hospital and is now applying to colleges pre-med. At DBG, we know that the future of our students and therefore the future of our community requires investing not just in literacy skills, but our students' confidence in their own dreams. And our data is reflective of this too. Well, reading level data is awesome. It helps us individualize plans so students like Kevin can read at their just right level. What we truly want to measure for our impact is how well our students are able to adapt, how well they can regulate, how well they can achieve their dreams and believe in it. So for this reason, we've partnered with multiple universities to create an annual evaluation, which uses validated surveys to assess how students perceive themselves in each of those domains. By centering student voices in the data that we collect, we're able to ensure that we're not just helping students achieve a prescribed skill set, but anything that they set their mind to. DBG develops students who know that they can accomplish anything that comes their way. And one of the ways that we really support students in developing this confidence is through interpersonal relationships. I want to share this quote with you because it's from one of our sixth graders and there's so many things I love about it. What kind of 11-year-old talks about like knowing I'm more confident now, I love that, that she's, she used to give up when she stuttered and now she tries again. But I think what really captures our mentorship approach here is that she says it's more fun when you read with other people. And this idea of fun and play is present in all parts of our programming at DBG. And in fact, um, Kali is often quoting the philosopher Plato saying, you can discover more from a person in one hour of play than a lifetime of questioning. 
we all know the ways that academic spaces can sometimes confine who we are. And so we really try and incorporate the idea of fun, not just in our athletic programming, but also in our academics. And it's part of what made Kevin's one-on-one -on -one in intervention so successful. They were spending four days a week together, but they weren't just focused on building skills, they were focused on having fun. When we took away all of the barriers, like um, helping him read at his just right level and now providing this familiar face because he's meeting with the same person every day when he came in. His literacy skills started to grow, but also his ability to connect to others. Where his energy used to be directed towards things like, what does this word mean? Can I do this? Now his imagination was able to wander and he was able to think, what's the perfect voice for this character? And in fact, he became so enthralled with playing and creating these character personas that as time went on, he even started to correct his own mentor. If they didn't read the voice exactly like his mentor had said, he would say, that said whisper, you have to read that quieter. <laughs> and this was so cool because we're just a few months earlier, he had been shutting down with his head on the desk anytime he was forced to read something. Now, literacy was a tool for Kevin to connect with others in new ways and share his creativity. Reading brought Kevin and his mentor closer together. And this is why it's so important that every day of the week, when DBG students come into our gym, they're met with relationships which provide them that consistent support, but also opportunities for fun where they can truly be themselves. And I think you heard it a little bit earlier today, but one of our mottos at DBG is that we train kids for life. And to do this, we can't just provide resources or teach skills, but rather DBG helps students claim their purpose in the world. Student agency and voice are at the heart of all of our program offerings so that students can apply their interests into new contexts of their choice. The foundational critical thinking skills which Kevin had developed through literacy are able to come to life in DBG's programs like our STEAM lab and our cooking class as he diverged from the recipe or made connections between chemistry and outer space, Kevin shaped his own relationship to the world through hands-on learning moments. DBG knows every student is capable of writing their own narrative, but we also know that that requires critical thinking skills like recognizing bias, way to go news literacy project, <laughs> um, forming connections and making inferences. At DBG, we don't tell our students what to think but we provide them the space and the tools to develop their own beliefs and dreams. And that's not to say that we don't expect our students to dream big, because we do. Like Katie had said, all of our students are part of the system, which is supposed to be serving them, but more often than not, is failing them. And our students are gonna have to be the ones who dream up the new solutions, new visions of the systems, and that they need to have new perspectives and critical thinking to apply that, and the belief in themselves that they can achieve it. So by providing opportunities to apply their critical thinking skills and deepen their relationship with the world, DBG creates a space for students to have a profound and lasting impact in their communities. So by leveraging these types of relationships and literacy, DBG is able to center all we do in our students' stories. From the programs that we offer to the data we collect, DBG is designed to make our students' voices heard. And I can tell you all about that but I would really much rather share one of our students' voices. Um, I have a short video of one of our student council members. Um, she was speaking at our annual fundraiser, and I think she does a really great job summarizing how it's so important to center youth voices in education. All the issues we've discussed today ultimately boil down to one fundamental factor, our education. As a community, we must empower ourselves to address these challenges proactively, meaning that it's time to shift our mentality from victim to victor. It's time to shift our focuses from seeking external solutions and instead taking the lead and resolving them ourselves. And it all starts with education. Why is it that the curriculum I receive in Detroit is five years behind the curriculum students my age receive in West Bloomfield? Why is there only one black-owned grocery store in a city that is 78% black? Why do black children feel the need to participate in gang-related activities and not extracurricular activities? 
It's time for us to become curious. How will we know the answers if we never ask the questions? How will we know what questions to ask if we lack the education? The student council is beginning to do our research and going around the city to educate the youth on what these issues are so that we can change them and, and have the youth grow up to, do the to make these changes. I want, to thank, I want to thank DBG for giving us the opportunities and the spaces to nurture our minds into becoming the next generation of leaders. And I want to thank all of you who came out tonight to support us and to support the important work that DBG does on a daily basis. My name, my name is Uriel Bath Yahweh, and I am proud to serve as the Vice President of DBG's Student Council. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Let's just take time for uh, just a short question. We're going to move on. But at lunch and whatever, we'll have more time to talk one on one. So anybody with right off the top of your head question? Somebody. Okay, so I, okay, oh, there's a question. All right, thank you, Mr. Litters, Chuck. Uh, thanks for this. Um, it's an amazing program. I might have missed this, but can you tell me, um, I imagine there are more students in Detroit that need your services than you can provide. Absolutely. What, what is your intake process and your selection process? Yeah, we have over a thousand students on our wait, waiting list. Um, we don't have any application system or anything. It's just word of mouth. So students, if there's a spot that's open, we just go off our website, pull someone in. But um, yeah, next steps for us are you know working on franchising and expanding outside of Detroit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bonjour. Everyone say bonjour. Bonjour. You've now greeted me in my language. So, Anishinaabe Moen. Lorene Roy, Indishnikas, Jagamoshiman, Makwadodam, Carlton, Minnesota, Minnawa, White Earth Reservation, and Da. Austin, Texas, and Nunjaba Nungamu. So that says I'm a Bear Clan. I'm from the White Earth Reservation, Minnesota. I currently live in Austin, Texas. But we're here to, to learn more about this great recipient of the International Award and world reader. Uh, they're vast, they're exciting, they're creative, and we're very privileged to have with us today Rebecca Chandler Leash, who had the job title of Chief Impact Officer and now is World Reader's Chief Executive Officer. She's gonna provide more information about World Reader and answer your questions. So welcome, Rebecca. Part of the joy of being here is meeting everyone and meeting Lorene and um, just really thank you for the gracious introduction and to Dr. Carla Hayden who welcomed and awarded us our prizes and to David M. Rubenstein for hosting this tremendous award ceremony. It is a day of celebration, is it not? As we reflect on how we together are improving literacy outcomes across the world. So as um, a newly appointed CEO to our organization, World Reader, it's really my honor to stand here on the um, steps of all my team members that have come before me, to all our partners around the world, to our friends here in the audience that have supported us financially, through technology and other ways um, to accept this honor. So who is World Reader? Part of our tagline is we do get children reading and it's our mission, we're anchored in working with parents and caregivers to work with their children ages three to 12 by providing the tools and resources to make them reading, to make reading um, a possible anywhere at any time. So for the last 
13 years, we've used technology. We were some of those early pioneers in the global south that said, gosh, let's leverage technology to new means. Now it's pretty commonplace. We've heard different platforms today, but we still leverage technology because we know it's efficient, it helps scale, and we can do a lot more understanding our data um, through it. As the World Bank, huh, I, I'm just talking and I'm supposed to be clicking, but it's not clicking, so that's okay. Thanks. Yeah, that, oh, thank you very much. As the World Bank recently noted, and you can read it up here, parents are key partners of teachers. Over the last 20 plus years, we have made in our sector critical investments in teacher training, school infrastructure, but we have paid little attention to the role of parents and caregivers in providing the foundational literacy skills needed right in their home early in their li children's life, right on the phone or the device that they own. COVID-19, as we've heard, began to showcase the tremendous potential families and community members can play in aiding their children in supporting this formal education sector. Since, since 2010, we've reached, next slide please, is it working now? Okay, yeah. thanks. We've reached over 22 million readers, families and children in over 100 countries. Think what's in, and these countries were reaching readers, so obviously we don't go in depth with them. But as an ed tech organization, we've committed to going in depth um, with uh, partners in over eight regions. And how do we do that? We do that through a blended model. We work with telecoms, so we work with corporations such as Opera or Reliance Geo in India or Moya in South Africa or MTN in Ghana, or Safaricom in Kenya. And we couple this with corporate partners. Amazon has been a partner of ours along the way, Humble Bundle, and many others. But we blend it with a broad array of local actors. Achievers Ghana, Barefoot College in India, Burst into Books in Chicago, large nonprofit organizations such as CARE, or World Vision, or Save the Children, and of course, with districts and governments. It really is an array of partners that will help us to reach these parents in their homes, in their communities, and get them reading to children. So this dual approach is both broad range and community-based, because it's our belief that if we provide the right tools and resources to parents and caregivers, accessible right on their own phone, it will lead to learning outcomes for their children over time. We seek to meet parents where they are, where they are with their children, and sometimes it's in the most unexpected places. Sometimes it's in laundromats, sometimes it's during parent-child prison visits, sometimes it's at daycare centers or after-school programs, or sometimes it's just in a church or a mosque after a service. As we know from our data, families do read anytime and anywhere, and boy, do we have a rich tapestry of global reading insights over these last 10 years. We drive reading, we drive parents and caregivers reading to their children by combining a variety of elements, and we affectionately call this internally our ABCDE model. First, it reflects, it's important to reflect on our target market. Parents today and caregivers between, that have children between the ages of three and 12, how old are they? They're gonna be under, typically under the age of 35. They're born almost as a digital native. They have a tool. They're well familiar with social media. I've been in very remote parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and I'm always surprised. There's a phone. They figure out how to charge it. They're on WhatsApp communicating. So this notion that there's not connectivity, of course it's not for everyone, but there is growing, growing connectivity around the world. So through our application, which we call BookSmart, and I encourage you to download it, you can find it on the Google Play Store or, or um, iStore, we provide access to curated children's collection of books, tailored for the age and level. We have over 3,000 titles in Arabic, English, Kiswahili, Spanish, and Hindi. So if you're working in any of those languages, please partner with us and use our resources. But we know that just providing books, we're all here because we love books, is not enough. How do we move the needle? Insights and confidence are critical for parents to understand their own child's development, the value of reading, the long-term education outcomes their children will have, the social-emotional outcomes that they will receive from reading, 
So we do a lot, in addition to the books, of building capacity with parents, helping them using science-based tips around child development. We support families on their journey with their children. And finally, we all agree, if you're a data-based organization or even if you're not, data is paramount, right? We just heard some great statistics from our friends in Detroit. Real-time data, these insights that we garner about time spent reading, the number of books that are open and children have been exposed to, the books completed, the type of tips that parents have read, the activities that they've generated, and much, much more. This data helps inform us on how we better engage. How many touch points do we need to have with a parent or a caregiver with their child to actually begin that practice and daily habit of reading together as a family? So we, as World Reader, we don't have the secret sauce yet, but we are striving to better understand the dosage, basically, of how do we affect that behavior change within the family and community setting. From Kenya to Peru, our impact is demonstrated across the globe in the voice of parents, caregivers, teachers, and of course, children themselves. But here on the left, we have teachers who use Booksmart to try and reach their families, to try and have their families reinforce the instruction that they're giving in their school. In India, we have had schools and teachers um, run greeting challenges, which is very common. But this really drives the increase in the number of books children actually complete and to be incentivized for it. But we know together we can make a difference. And this forum today allows us to join hands, right? Consider and brainstorm, I believe this afternoon, alternative approaches of addressing learning crisis. For World Reader, we're really looking at two new factors on how can we do this. One is, how do we use media and local influencers more effectively that draw the attention of young parents? If you're 35 and under, you're on Instagram, you're on YouTube, you are in being influenced by a myriad of voices. How can we use some of those strong voices to have a stronger and more positive narrative around reading? We also recognize that for a long time, the healthcare center sector and education really weren't as closely aligned as we think they should be. How do you work with maternal and child health care centers to really begin that reading process early on in a child's life? These are new avenues in which World Reader is exploring. So I encourage us and I look forward to your ideas. How can we reach behind, beyond our horizons of the education sector and really reach parents where they are. Whether it's through agriculture, I was talking with Wise Zambia, like how do we work through the agriculture sector to reach the mothers who are working hard but know that they wanna give better education for their daughters and their sons. So from refugee settings on our left, a mother, a Syrian refugee in Jordan, to the mountains of Peru, this lovely 12-year-old boy whose new horizons have been opened, we are transforming the lives of stories so today, we are creating the story, all of us in this room. We're creating a story because we're leaders, and people are going to look back on what we've done together, how we've moved the needle together in a new story for the health of our children in the future. Thank you again for honoring us today for this amazing celebration, and that we're together going to change the trajectory of our learning crisis. Thank you very much. smell the food, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's complex. It's I complex, mean, yeah. it is. I remember reading your application and hearing you again. I, I'm learning something every time I hear, hear more. Yes, I think I see a question. Hi, just a quick question. Where do you get your resources for Booksmart? Because that would really show what languages people can go there to find sure. books in, right? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So um, we believed firmly, and this is important in our history, that we would work with local publishers and working in the Global South with local publishers. So over our years, we have worked with over 400 local publishers and creating relationships with them. Um, and so we do draw on our local publishing, so if you are in Ghana, your collection that you would open up on your phone will look different than if you are in Kenya 
or look different here in the United States. So we are tailoring to context, but we are also bringing in a global voice. We curate our collection in the following ways. We do as much as we can source from local publishers. We think it's super important to build um, that strength. We're never gonna have a reading culture if you don't have a strong publishing association in a country, so that's one. We do know that there are gaps, so we will commission content, but there we will use a local author or a local illustrator um, in writing that story. And third, we do use some creative commons and open source um, at times, we will update the cover, we will make some modifications to make the book more engaging. But for us, it's really driving, is that book inspiring enough for a child to want to open it, for a parent and child to have a rich dialogue around it? There's a lot of good creative commons. There's a lot that's not so great. Um, and so we really work hard on our curation process. Great question, great answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have time for one more question. Let me run. I think I see you moving around. This is like a classroom. I forgot to tell you I'm a retired professor. I'm looking like <laughs> who's avoiding my eyes. I see your hand there in the left. What do you say to people who are concerned about print books versus digital books and the differences in the brain that might be happening, you know, uh, according to Marianne Wolf about uh, digital reading versus print reading? Isn't that one of my favorite questions? Thank you so much for asking. And I, I realize she's a new uh, friend of ours. She's been using Booksmart already in um, Austin, Texas. So thank you. Um, Gosh, I think it's not even an and or or, right? I mean, the reality is children, parents today, are children are on a device, they are using it. Can we use, kind of replace some of that time with some positive engagement with books? We're not taking digital away from any children in the future going forward, and we must ensure that they're using digital wisely, as we heard um, from our friends with News Literacy Project. Right? Uh, so it's, to me, it's not an either or. Um, I think if we were in a place where there were enough print resources, uh, particularly in the global south, sure, that'd be great. But we have found research over research, time and um, energy that we will never be able to produce enough content in enough languages to the children that need it most. And so let us use at least the technology that can enable at least access and where they can purchase or where they can be given great content in languages that they understand, wonderful. So that's my answer. Yeah. I was just at the uh, European Conference on Information Literacy, got back from Krakow, mm -hmm. and we were emailing while sitting on the floor in Heathrow <laughs> Airport because I was there all night. On the floor. <laughs> but at the ESIL, the European Conference on Information Literacy, we followed the work of Diana, Diane Mizrachi. And she has done and launched many studies on looking at what undergraduates prefer, print or electronic. It's always print. Mm -hmm. And so uh, really interesting. They rep reproduced that study in many countries, and she just talked about the, the latest reproduction is print. It's interesting because actually we the global um, USAID, World Bank, FDCO did a study in 2016 called the Global Book Feasibility Fund study. And it was conducted by Results for Development. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, you don't actually have paper produced in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the cost of bringing in paper from India or bringing it in from somewhere else, governments cannot absorb that tremendous cost. So when you're looking at producing textbooks which children need in print, they're prioritizing that. But that same study proved more, just as essential are the storybooks that will empower, and there are so many communities that will never have the ability to actually have the volume that's needed. Yeah. I was gonna say, we actually have 15 more minutes, so yeah, we can take more questions. I think we have one here. We can solve problems yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. As someone who's lived in, in Kenya for many years and who's married to a Ghanaian, oh, I'm perfect. wondering. <laughs> Why uh, Kiswahili in Kenya, but English in Ghana? Oh, we actually have Twi in other languages in Ghana. That's a great question, yes. Um, part of the Twi and uh, there are 11 national languages in Ghana. Part of the, um, we have as much as we can acquire, but there are not a ton of children's 
books. There's a lot of curriculum in um, Twi and the other languages, but not a, as many storybooks and engagement that are applicable for younger age just yet. Hi, just going back to your question of, or the comments about print versus digital, I'll say I have an 11 year old who reads Booksmart and he completely with his other friends, they read digital versus print just because it's not about the number of hours you spend on the screen, it's a quality of the screen time, right? And so I'd just like to know about the types, the categories of books that World Reader offers and because it is a global organization, what kind of things, like do you talk about refugees and IDPs and whatnot, do you talk about climate change? So love to hear more about that. Great question. So out of our 3,000 books, we have really categorized them into some really inspiring collections and categories that you can search and find. One particularly related to just the mental health and social emotional well-being that's needed and to be discussed and to be encouraged am among our children and even our parents and caregivers, we have a collection called My Special Word. It's really anchored on having, the, uh, having a child um, understand that the power of one word that they can live into can be life-changing. So we have a whole collection that's wrapped around that, available in Spanish and English. Um, trying to think if it's available in any other languages. So that's one. We have a whole climate change um, series that we've pulled together that really helps just bring the understanding into the household at a level that um, children can begin to take some action even around their homes, which is super interesting. Women in sports, women in tech, we have a variety of smaller collections that will really help inform gender equality, gender norms, discussions that need to be had in many of the cultures in which we're working. That's to name a few. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks Hi. again for sharing more about World Reader today. Um, so I have a question about the insights you're learning from the adults who are reading with the children on Booksmart. Is it the parents, are there guardians, are teachers using it? Who's our children picking up and reading the books on their own? Could you share a little more about um, how this app is being used and who's going in there? Great. When it is a home setting, and I would say this is pretty much around the Global South, when it's a home setting, it is primarily either a mother or an older sibling that would be reading to their children or their younger sibling. Um, our value or the what we want to put importance on is not handing the advice to a child because most of these children are not literate enough to read um, confidently on their own and so you actually do need that older influencer sibling adult to be reading aloud or to be storytelling if you're a three-year-old the child can't read that content directly anyhow but a parent can take those pictures, the illustrations within a story and begin to storytell and have that nice dialogue, um, ask all the questions about the story that you wanted. So in the home, it's really generally of the mother. When we see a father engage, it's super, super exciting. University of Leeds put out a study in The Guardian not about two weeks ago that said, gosh, if a father can read, it has a, has a profound impact on that child's literacy going forward. We often see caregivers, they could be what we call mamapreneurs or papapreneurs that run informal daycare centers or daycare centers facilitators. There they will use Booksmart as a group reading session with their young children. Um, they will take activities that we provide and conduct them to bring the book alive at the end. And then teachers often use it as a, a tool, um, I wouldn't say homework, but as an encouragement out to families to re-engage in the reading process with their children based on the instruction that the, child, the student had received. So we really see those categories of reading, um, but when it's at the home, we, that can be any place, any time. Another question? Your minds are working, I can tell. You're thinking, you're connecting. Joe Sanchez. A simple one. Uh, what's next? What What are the big plans for? The oh, next great of question. Years? You were the one that asked how some one other great question like that too. Great big plans. One, we are re um, releasing a new version of our application next year, which will be far more um, 
tailored to that family experience. So we're very excited about that, really helping and co integrating all of these tips and activities that we've done into a more holistic experience mm -hmm. for reading at home, really driving that um, parent and caregiver experience. The other piece is really looking as an organization, as I mentioned at the end, how do we um, affect behavior change with influencers and using um, communications and marketing more effectively. I think it's a this whole digital marketing element where parents are getting already a lot of messages. How can we be more creative in that space, which is typically not an education forte, right? So we're pushing ourselves outside that boundary. And then my second area of focus for the organization is how do we embrace maternal and child health care um, and integrating that because if we can start earlier in a child's life and start building that practice through the home, just like a parent teaches their child to eat by themselves, they teach them, we teach them so much, right? Why can we not begin that reading process right from birth um, and begin to institute that? It will have tremendous impact in five years on our, for the teachers, you know, as they're starting instruction. So those are the, the big areas. Um, our content is freely available. If any of you, whoops, sorry, in Spanish, English, Swahili, Arabic, Hindi, if you work in any of those languages, please, please use our content. Take Book Smart and incorporate it as creatively as you can. We'd be honored. Um, it's out there thanks to our gracious um, donors that have you know, helped us build this wonderful library. I think that's a good segue to whatever happens next. <laughs> and let's thank World Reader and congratulate them once again. Thank you so much. All right, if we can give another round of applause to all of our speakers this morning.